Okay. What I would tell young engineers is to become very familiarized with design codes as much as they can. So um, if, you're, if you're in the structural uh, discipline, um, I would suggest to become very familiarized with uh, the structural steel design code, the reinforced concrete design code. Um, if you can, wood, uh, which is the NDS. Um, any other design code um, that you can become familiarized with as you're taking your uh, electives, if you happen to take them in, in structural, that's even more uh, beneficial. But I would suggest to uh, try to get the most out of the, the school, the being in school uh, experience. So it, it really helps out to, to get you know, a head start during school and more or less know uh, what the provisions are, what the requirements are, um, just kind of, they're very thick codes and there's, it's a lot to go through, but um, it, it helps out a lot to, to understand these concepts and, and also to, I would say as you're learning, um, some, some of these design classes that, you, that are offered in school, they, they work hand in hand with the design codes. So that's really helpful. Um, but it, it's, it, it shows when a student is, is, is really sharp and you know, has, has some sort of background as opposed to just being at zero. So that helps. Another thing I would suggest is um, we're, in a, we're in, 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 a, in a design phase where most things are, are done with uh, software, with engineering software. I would say to, um, to become uh, or to sharpen up as much as possible using um, uh, design calc sheets uh, or software such as Excel, MathCAD, MATLAB. I'm not sure what's used today in school, but that's what I use mostly, basically Excel and MathCAD to do my own programming. Um, but it really helps out. It's a great time saver. It's a great, uh, great tools for quality control to, to double check um, you know, external software that we use as well. So it's good to have your own in-house software um, because it saves a lot of time. It, it brings in a lot of quality control. So I would say uh, as far as design, that's what, what I would recommend to, to become familiarized with uh, programming of your own, to not depend so much on, on, on other software. Um, I think that would be it. Those are my, my, my key um, tips that I would, that I would recommend. My name is Alexis Martinez. I'm the director of the Structural Engineering Division here at Eastern Engineering. And uh, I will show you guys today what I'm working on. I wanted to show you um, what I meant by um, how we model uh, structures on a software and then we make sure that we check and we validate that software to make sure the design is working. Okay, so this is, uh, this is basically the, the foundation for an eight-story building. I'm gonna show you what the calculations uh, look like, the, the isometric printout from the, the program that we use to model this. So this one was modeled in ETABS. This is the, um, the final um, calculation set that we use to that we generate to submit to the city. And this building was modeled in ETABS. So here's an isometric of the building. This is an eight story building. And uh, the actual, the superstructure was completely modeled in ETABS. This building consists of uh, seven inch reinforced concrete slabs uh, supported by reinforced concrete columns um, as the main gravity system. And uh, for the lateral system, it's, it's using uh, four uh, cores 
So four uh, shear walls, pretty much, which are the staircases. This being one of the staircases. This is the other staircase. And these two uh, shafts, which, which are the elevators. All of these are reinforced concrete uh, walls. So uh, as you can see, the shape, the building has an irregular shape. Uh, that's because part of it, you know, part of it comes off on the west, east, and north sides. So as I was telling you, one of the things we do is uh, once we input all these loads onto the model, uh, what we do is the next step is to check the model. So we have to validate the reactions of the model. So we use those reactions. First, we check that the gravity loads are being properly transferred. In order to do that, we do hand calcs. So pretty much, let me show you uh, how we first check, uh, or one of the things that we first check, which is the, the axial diagrams for the columns. So that would be, I took a screenshot. Okay, so as, as I was saying, you, you see um, this is an axial uh, load diagram for the, for the columns. So the first thing we check is that the actual, uh, the, the right magnitude of loads uh, increase from floor to floor. This would be the roof level. So there's uh, an initial axial load of 97.86 kips. As you know, a kip is a thousand pounds. So every floor adds additional load to, to that column. So the first thing we validate is that at the base of the building, uh, the, the proper amount of axial load is being transferred down by a specific column. So we check a few columns and that is done. Let me, let me uh, share now uh, the Excel spreadsheet that we use to, to validate this. Let me switch to this guy. So this is an example of um, column at grid line F9. So this column, as you can see, it's uh, from ground level to, to the roof. You know, it has these dimensions. So um, it, this spreadsheet is, is pretty, uh, pretty exhaustive. It, it includes uh, a lot of different parameters such as the thickness of the slab. But in, in this particular case, for the summation of the axial loads, all we're interested in is the, the total sum of loads. The, the diagram I showed you guys on the, on the last uh, slide wasn't for this project. So of course this number is not gonna, uh, it's not gonna add up exactly. But just to give you an idea, we, we do this for lots of columns. Once we run the analysis on, on ETABs, just so that we can know, you know how much axial load is, is expected, just uh, dead plus live loads uh, on, on, on a few particular columns. And then once we, all these numbers check out, they don't need to be exactly the same because this is a hand calculation just using a uh, tributary area, uh, which is right here. But as long as a few of them match, then we can be certain that the design has been validated. So once the gravity loads are validated on the model, uh, we have sort of half of our analysis confirmed and the other half would be the lateral loads, which the lateral loads in here in South Florida, they come from, from wind. So those are your, your lateral loads. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, this building is in Broward. So for a category two building, uh, we used 170 uh, miles per hour to design this building. So that, that wind speed generates a pressure and that pressure is applied to the facade of the building and that that pressure generates uh, a lateral point force on each, on each diaphragm. Um, so then the, that's the next thing we check. Let me switch now to the lateral load uh, confirmation. Okay. So now to check the wind, uh, this is another, another spreadsheet I created just so that, you know, this is just based off uh, ASE 10, ASE 710. 
now the code switched to ASE 716. So now I have to update it, uh, update this a little bit, or at least uh, review it to make sure nothing has changed. Um, but this is just pretty much a, a spreadsheet that when you provide these inputs, just uh, building dimensions and building height, uh, design uh, wind speed, uh, and these parameters, you end up with these base years right here. So these are the base years that we, we check for them to, to sort of match what, what ETAB's analysis results provide. And until, until those values are 5% uh, close to, to these numbers, uh, we don't move forward and, and continue from the analysis phase to the design phase. So we always break it up into two phases, just our analysis, which we use a software for, and then we move on to, to the design phase. Uh, but until the loads are validated and the analysis is validated, we, we, we can move forward. That, that's what I meant by, by having to constantly create tools to, to use these advanced new software such as eTabs and, and softwares that make, that make our life easier, but uh, they, have to be, we, they have to be treated uh, as powerful tools, but that also requires engineers. They require people um, to, to provide the correct data, data entry. Without that, then these softwares are really doing nothing. So um, this is what a typical um, calculation set looks like. Uh, th that's not the cover page. This is the cover page uh, for a building. And then you have your, your index and then all the, the relevant calculations that, you know, that were performed on the project. Um, so there's a lot of uh, hand checking and see these, these softwares, uh, these, these uh, printouts are from a MathCAD sheet. Uh, this format looks a little bit different than the Excel because it's, it was actually programmed in, in MathCAD. That's why it looks different. Um, let me see if, if anything interesting comes up that I can mention. These are just uh, printouts from, from eTabs of all the different uh, load combinations that were used uh, to design this building. Um, these are the applied loads. These are just the loads that, that were applied on the system and the, the member sizes. So you see it's a seven inch slab, uh, 3000 PSI concrete. These are the elevator shafts. Uh, this is the, the uh, staircase, the main staircase uh, or one of the main staircases. So this means it's a shear wall. So its main purpose is to take lateral forces. It's also used as a gravity support, but um, it, it's primarily uh, to stabilize the building laterally. Um, let me keep going. This is the, uh, the upper floors. These are uh, just the applied loading on the floor system, superimposed loads, uh, uh, superimposed dead, superimposed live. So, so this package, we, we prepare it to, to submit to the building department and the structural reviewer at the building department uh, will review this package and, and just check for code compliance, check our design, our structural plans and, and calculations for code compliance and he may request to receive the actual ETAPS file if it's easier for him to, to review it that way. Um, these are just uh, the columns. So these are the column sections. This means it's a 10 by 20 column, uh, 3000 PSI, compressive strength. Oh yes, okay, Th this particular building had, a, had an offset, uh, the, the units, above the sixth level uh, were a little bit offset due to that change in facade. And these columns could not be aligned with the columns below. Let me show you guys what that looks like. Uh, on, uh, this is what it looks like in elevation. I can also show you what it looks like on plan view. 
at the sixth level. Let me change the, the screen. Um, so, so in plan view, this is what it looks like. So you see this, this column is, um, is being erected uh, off of the sixth level. And this is the one on the floor below, which has this uh, sort of odd shape. So the one in dashed lines is the one below. So the way we frame this, it's called a, a core belt column. So uh, since the columns could not align due to architectural requirements, because the building sort of uh, stepped back at the sixth level, but at the same time in the interior, in the inside of the units, they needed all this space uh, for, for the utility of, of, of the floor plan in architecture. So the way we, we, we take a condition like this is usually do a transfer beam or just do a core belt column, which is what we did for this project. Um, I, I don't have that detailed here. I can probably open up the PDF. Let me see if I can open that up so I can show what that looks like. So, <clears throat> so this is what that looks like on, on the actual plans. This is uh, the detailing for the uh, core belt columns. So as you can see, the column on the sixth level is offset from the column below. So this, this would be the load path. So pretty much this is sort of like a, a reinforced concrete sort of truss. Uh, so the, the members are, are working, uh, this guy is in compression, the top is in tension. And then this one is just continuing the reinforcement and, and finishing off your, your truss system, which is uh, embedded. If you take a, a, an advanced reinforced uh, concrete class, you'll see that this is uh, designed using the, uh, the strut and tie method. Sort of works like a deep beam kind of. So this is the way we, uh, we frame it into the plan. So there's two of them because they have different dimensions. If you compare this, this offset is different than this one right here. So that's that condition that we happen to uh, come across. Let me change, let me go back to the uh, calculations really quick. Okay, they're actually here. There we go. So that, that was this condition here. It was sort of flipped, but it's the same condition. Yeah, so, so this would be the reinforcement for those members as, uh, as a design output by the software, which, so we take this reinforcement and we review it and we make sure that it's working uh, the way we want it to. Um, so we pretty much check it by hand as well as uh, with this software. Um, so the, the foundation for this one was done in safe. So if you see here, this is, this is the foundation for uh, the shear walls, which are the members that take the lateral loads. This is the staircase, these two right here. And this one is the main uh, elevator shaft. Um, and then the foundation for for the columns was, was done using another spreadsheet that we use to design the columns for the, for the isolated footings. Um, let me see anything else interesting I could show you. So the, the final product of, of that design uh, of all the calculations uh, ends up being ends up looking on the plan, uh, you know, according to what you see here. So each column pretty much has an isolated footing, which uh, distributes the load, the concentrated load from that column onto the substrate, which is the the soil below, the compacted soil. So these large pads are for the shear walls. These are the uh, elevator shafts, and these are the staircases, and for this building, that's, that's pretty much the framing. Just reinforced concrete walls, uh, reinforced concrete columns, and, and reinforced concrete shear walls. Um, this, this one's not that tall. This is eight-story building. So this is typical Miami construction. Uh, this one in particular doesn't have post-tension slabs. Um, 
at another point, I can show you uh, what a post tension uh, slab design looks like. Instead of uh, using uh, reinforcement, the main the main uh, reinforcement in that case, uh, instead of using mild steel, will, will would be uh, tendons. Uh, so there will be uh, they're sort of like uh, seven wire strand cables that are laid out on the slab and they're post tension uh, during during construction. So the only difference is that the columns are would be a little bit more spaced out. So maybe if we remove this column and we remove this column, then you'll get more of a of a post post tension uh, slab column spacing. But we can look at that one at, at another point. I think um, that's all I have. Thank <laughs> you.